If it's team too much, I'm good with that. It's gonna be too much. It's gonna be too much when it walks in the room. It's gonna be too much in the result. It's gonna be too, it's gonna be too much. Write that down. The ultimate businesswoman. Sold hundreds of millions of dollars of real estate. Public speaker, expert on all things real estate, marketing, brand development, sales. You've owned and operated a chain of beauty salons. Polish Bar Brooklyn for years. When I moved to New York in 1997, Myrtle Avenue was called Murder Avenue. Then here comes this woman who comes and opens this extremely luxe spa. You open a business, people drag you. Like, why would you put that here in Clinton Hill? Like they just kick a hole in my glass door. Just crazy stuff. No one captures the reality of how crazy it is to, to build out an idea. What is it that when Polish Bar opens, it's oversubscribed? What is it that you're doing that when you start in real estate, deals are already there? I'm very intentional about how I'm viewed. With my first business, it was important to me that people saw it as different and better. When you started to realize and understand and really embrace the fact that you were different. There's a meme somewhere out there that's like, this mf -er never misses. And I'm like, I want people to say that about me. She don't ever miss. Nope, she don't ever miss. I don't, I don't have the luxury of missing. What makes you say that you don't have the luxury? I still believe that for what I am trying to do specifically is build a sizable business in New York City real estate as a black woman, but I don't have that luxury. No. Kill it every time. All right. Welcome to the Callum Johnson Show. Um, I'm Callum and we have Trisha Lee. Trisha, how you doing? I'm good. I'm so excited to get you on. Oh, really? um, <laughs> when we were doing, you know, I, I obviously I do research for every episode. Mm -hmm. I'll look into the guests, their background. And after I watched videos, read articles, looked on all of your social media, the phrase that came to mind was the ultimate businesswoman. Mm. And so I'm going to, um, I want to give the audience your background. Yeah. And then we can get deeper into it because I actually think the story, the story is so much more interesting than even what the titles and the accolades can say. Got it. Um, so obviously you're a real estate agent at the Sirhan Group, which is Ryan Sirhan's brokerage. Mm -hmm. uh, you lead the Trisha Lee team, mm -hmm. sold hundreds of millions of dollars of real estate, public speaker, expert on all things real estate, marketing, brand development, sales, mm -hmm. prominent member of the community, regularly organizing and running events. Uh, that support, educate, and empower women in real estate yes. and other small businesses. You've owned and operated a chain of beauty salons, mm -hmm. Polish Bar Brooklyn, for mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. um, a decade. <laughs> yeah, a decade. A decade of my life. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Trisha Lee, everyone. It's yeah. A, it's, an impressive, it's an impressive list of accolades. Well, it sounds good when you say it. I don't ever think about it like that. I always feel like I'm trying to do this right now, you mm. know, but... Everything for me is like, I'm on the mountain, mm. right? I never, once it's done, it's like, I don't even, it's not even thought of anymore. Um, but yeah, it sounds good. I like the, I like the sound of it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you actually, you know what? That's an interesting point. Do you ever have those kind of, will there be quiet moments where you kind of soak that in? Like even saying that you've sold like hundreds of millions of dollars of mm -hmm. real estate. Yeah. It's like, how does someone even get their mind around that achievement? Like, do you have those moments where it kind of sinks in or is it just still kind of... This episode is brought to you by Free Agency. If you want to take your career to the next level, Free Agency is a company that you should check out. They manage and represent talent in the tech industry and they provide you with a dedicated talent agent to help you find, engage, and win top of market roles that will maximize your earning potential. No more leaving money on the table. Stop job searching alone and start building your dream career today with Free Agency. Anyway, back to the show. I wish I did. I don't though. Um, I don't remember a time in my life where I wasn't um, goal oriented. Mm. So no, I don't think anything sinks in. And I've had some big moments and I've had some huge moments as of late, but I don't know, maybe, maybe the good and the bad of it is that I am driven, but I think the other side of it is that, no, I, I can't say I ever let things soak in. Like there've been like one or two times in the last year where I've been like, I can't believe this is happening right now. Mm. But even in that moment, it's more of a disbelief, not because I'm not aware of what I'm capable of, um, but I'm always so focused on like what I need to get done, right? That mm. I'm not really sitting back and being like, oh, look at, you know, like, I mean, I'm aware, it's not lost on me. Like, mm. I think a lot of times women feel like they have to behave as if they don't know how amazing they are. I'm, I'm aware, mm. <laughs> um, but I don't focus on it ever, really. No, I'm always trying to think of how am I going to be able to do 
whatever my newest you know focus is and that that's ever changing um that is the the curse of the gift i think is that the goal keeps moving mm. right but i've made peace with that you know mm. because i feel like it's such a gift to be a driven person naturally you mm. know like everything i have to do is really self motivated um i haven't had a boss in 17 years mm. so I'm thankful that I still have drive because I know that it, it could be lost at any time. And so I'm just thankful because the drive is what you need to have the motivation to get up and do things and to get things done and to care and to care all the way through until the end and to look at those details. Like, you know, before we got started, you're like, do most brokers do that? No, but it's not about what most brokers do. It's about how I want to do it and what I do. So I accept the good and the bad of all those things. And I do always try to accept, like, accept this is the gift of this situation. But the curse is like, no, there's never any sense of accomplishment for me. As sad mm. as that sounds, it just isn't. Um, if I'm being honest, I may try to schedule to celebrate something or plan to like sit back and like enjoy that moment. But I'm already sitting back like, okay, and now? <laughs> mm. And then, you know, it's like plot twist, we're gonna do next, what's the next chapter? Um, and I'm grateful for that because I want to keep creating and doing and being inspired to do more and do less sometimes, but just to keep moving, right? Mm. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that you refer to it as, I guess it's almost like a gift and a curse. And the reason I say that is it almost implies that it's like innate, mm -hmm. uh, that it was always in you. Yeah. Um, where do you think that level of drive, that level of ambition, that level of, okay, what's the next thing? Mm -hmm. Where did it begin for you? Where did it begin? You know, I have these stories that I hear of myself as a child at like four and five years old and being very specific and detail oriented even then. Um, so I think it's just always been there, but I think that like so much of what we take in or what I took in during the most formidable years of my life have created this personality. And I think I spent a lot of time probably like in my twenties trying to figure out like why do things matter so much to me? And mm -hmm. then I got to a point in my life and my career where I started to realize that that was what was special about me. You know, that I, maybe I do overthink things or I do wanna look at them from another perspective or I do wanna consider it from this way or as simple as even being in a transaction, I wanna think about is the buyer getting what they need? Is the seller getting what they Does everyone feel like they're winning in this situation? And maybe that's a lot to put into it, but I don't know. I don't fight who I am anymore. You know, I just utilize who I am and how uniquely different I am to get where I want to go. Like that has just become a lot less work for me is to say, yeah, like you're particular about that and these things matter to you and maybe they shouldn't, but they do. So let's roll with it, you know? Mm. I mean, I just think it's always been, I think since I was a child, I was always other, I was always different. You know, I was always, always the only black girl in the room, you know, always the only black person in the building. Mm. Um, and that's just because of how I grew up in an environment in Arizona, in the Valley where like minorities were just a, such a few, you know, just a speckle here and there. Mm at that time, probably still now, I'm not sure. Um, and I think what I did at that time was to really pay close attention to what everyone else was doing so that I could fade into the background a little bit and like not always feel so other, not always feel so different, mm -hmm. right? So you're like, you're just paying attention to more. You're paying attention to everything. Like I know where every camera is in this room, like I, those are the things I take in. Um, so I think that that's where it came from. I think it came from a really insecure space, honestly, like just caring more, being more particular, trying harder, working harder, and then just um, growing up in an environment where I grew up in a single family home, like my mom was um, taking care of me and my sister and doing a really great job to do that. I, I never felt like we grew up with less because we grew up in a single family home. But I'm very aware of what it took to create that for us and that reality, right? That mm -hmm. hard work, that drive. I saw someone get up every day and run that same schedule every single day. Like I could time the, the time that my mom would come into my room, turn on my light and say, rise and shine. It was exactly 7.05 in the morning, right? And that went mm -hmm. on for years. So you see that hustle, you see that spirit of someone. And I think I was just being trained on how to have that disciplined and then also just 
really trying to figure out how to conform and fit into this environment being so different. And you only can do that by figuring out what everyone else is doing. So you're watching everything. So it mm. creates this a space where your brain is just overactive all the time, mm. you know, but now I think it's my absolute special gift. I think it's something that is, is great about me because I can be doing multiple things at one time and paying attention to small details in all of those spaces at the same time. And I want more out of most things than I think my peers do. Like I want more out of this podcast than your other interviewers got, you know, I want mm. more out of my work. I want my brand to do more. I want my business to do more. I want to stand out above and beyond. It's like I'm making up for all of that time that I was trying to do this. It's like now I want to do this. And I think that they're linked because as you grow up, you just start to realize like, oh, wait, I can use this, you know? And that's what I've learned how to do is I've tried to use all those quirks about my personality because there are a lot of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I've tried to use all of them to benefit me in my life. Um, and I embrace them, all of, all of the things. So they're like, well, you know, Trisha's gonna have, yep, I'm gonna have everything. I'm gonna have a list, I'm gonna have, an or I'm gonna have organized, everybody's gonna have their part, I'm gonna have to do a run through with you in the day. And they're like, this, it's, like it's not that big of a deal, it's that big of a deal to me, you know, mm. because I'm doing it and my name's on it. And I'm lucky enough to be at the point now where I've built that reputation for myself in every room I enter, in any space that I'm in, whether I'm with my sorority sisters, whether I'm working, whether I'm working out, whether I'm just with friends, whether I'm hosting at my home, I just have that reputation. So now people expect that from me. They, I think they digest it a lot easier. And I'm definitely at a point where people trust the results because they know that I care just as much or more than they do. Mm. You, know? you know what I think is so relatable? And I felt it myself, which is you talk about being like the only black girl in the room. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's nuance that comes specifically with that. But I think people feel it in different ways. I'm the only ex in the room or like just feeling like the odd one out or that you don't, yeah. you don't belong. Yeah. And what comes from that, and I felt it personally, I've also seen it uh, with siblings, with my peers. There's like this anxiety, right? Oh, absolutely. It's and completely anxiety inducing. It's, an, it's anxiety inducing. And it's like your mind is constantly running. I like the way that you describe it. It's like your mind is constantly running and being aware of these small details so you can just perfectly fit in. Don't cause too much harm or raucous Nothing in this to see environment. Here. Don't worry about me, yeah. I'm just here, absolutely. Just kind of fade into the background. And the reason I mention it, I think it's detrimental to people's lives. It is, I absolutely. Think it, I think it holds people back from reaching their full potential. And so when we talk about getting value from this episode and this mm -hmm. conversation, I want to know when it shifted for you, mm -hmm. when you started to realize and understand and really embrace the fact that you were different. Mm -hmm. And when that switch occurred, what motivated it? Mm -hmm. What made it happen? I think for me, like the, when I first realized that I... Well, what I hear the most is I take things too far, right? Like you take it too far. It's not, it doesn't require all that. Like mm -hmm. you're doing too much. Um, and I think I started hearing that when I first moved to New York and started trying to figure out my life and my career that mattered the most to me. Like it really was important to me to figure that part out. I was somebody that wanted to move to New York and wanted to build myself and my career. And that was the only thing that I prioritized. And I was honest about it, unapologetic about it. And I still feel that way. Like I felt that that's what I wanted to focus on. And I'm glad that I spent that time really focused on developing myself and my work ethic and my work style and my work pride at that time. Um, because now my life has changed and I have so many other priorities and so many other things that matter to me that I fold in or maybe fold my career around. And I can do both well now, I think, because I've already worked out the kinks in how I show up in my career and how I show up in my business. And, and, and my reputation is the same in every space that I enter. Like everyone's like, oh, Trisha's here. So she's probably gonna be the loudest. She's probably gonna be the most outspoken. She's definitely gonna be the most direct. She's gonna be very specific about what she wants. Just ask her, cause she already thought about every single thing where she wants every cup, every plate, every everything. Mm. And um, 
I look back now and I'm like, good. Like, I don't have to like prove myself in that way anymore because I've built a reputation in multiple industries for being exactly who I am. Um, so I'm glad that I did it then. And then I can be more curious about other areas of life now. So like, you know, I'm in a space now where I'm more focused on just wellness and my own self-love, how I treat myself, um, seeing the world, building experiences with my partner. Um, I can have those priorities now in a way that I couldn't back then. So I, I think it worked out the way it needed to. Mm. But the overthinking and overanalyzation of everything has really come in as a benefit to everything that I do because I was, you know, building my work style in my 20s and I stayed longer and I tried harder and I redid it one more time and I would come up with suggestions and figure things out. And even in the workspace in my beauty career, it was I was the best at what I did. I was the best at what I did. You know, like I had the strongest reputation in my market for doing what I did because I cared a lot, you know, and I mm. gave it a lot. I just never yeah. remember caring about how long I was at work. Mm. I just wanted to get it done right, you know? And I think that led to me being so curious about cosmetics and the cosmetic world and how people made money there and how they built businesses. And so I'm working for a company, but I'm taking notes and paying attention as this company is expanding drastically. And I used all of those experiences and knowledge and note taking to really open my own brand. So 30 years old, I'm opening this business and it takes off, but it takes off because I'm prepared and I've been taking notes and I've been applying all the things I've been learning in my job to now my business. So it's like I got to mentor really in someone else's office. Mm -hmm. And so when I started, you know, Polish Bar, I had already worked for brands that had built themselves to be the number one cosmetic names in the country. And I knew the inner workings of how they did it. And I knew it not because I was there and a part of it, because I asked questions and I really made it my business to understand and how to have suggestions and bring things to the front to make their business better. Because I cared. I genuinely cared about what I was doing. So I left that situation just far more knowledgeable and skilled than most people probably would have. And I know that to be true because I can sit back and look at who we all were and who, where we are now, you mm -hmm. know? So that's why I say I embrace those things about me because I have examples in my life every day of what that has done for me and how that has propelled me by being that quirky personality. Um, so now I'm in that space of embracing those things, but learning better habits around the busyness of the mind and the busyness of just overanalyzing and overthinking and being full of anxiety around things. When really, if you free yourself of all that, the best, purest version of you comes through. Mm. And that's the magic. Mm. But I think I'm just now in that space where I can do that, mm. you know, honestly, like in the last few years. Mm. So it comes across effortless. It's not effortless. I fine tuned it. And there's a difference. Mm. You know, give yourself the time to fine tune your shit. <laughs> mm. I have fine, fine tuned this. I know how to walk into a room and dominate and speak my piece and add to the conversation and observe what's important and just make an important contribution in any space. I don't care what we're talking about. I know how to do that, but I fine tuned that over time. Mm. You know, is it a talent? Yeah, but I've had to work it and figure it out because it can all be very chaotic if you think about it, because what, what it, where it comes from is a very chaotic space. So mm -hmm. I think I've learned to just deliver it better and mm -hmm. to um, and to honestly celebrate it. Like I really do celebrate at least my gifts now in a way that I don't think I did before. Mm. You know? Yeah, I would say that. Yeah, it's fine tuned. I am. Um, I want to go back to like the origins of Polish Bar. Mm hmm. You talk about being 30 years old and having kind of, I guess, kind of studied and been in the industry mm -hmm. and taken your notes and taken your lessons. Um, and it seems like you had a vision of what it could be. Mm -hmm. I want to, and you know, what, actually, I want to read, um, I want to read a quote from one of your friends she was talking about when you started the company. Mm. She said, when I moved to New York in 1997, Myrtle Avenue was called Murder Avenue. It was. <laughs> then here comes this woman who opens, uh, who comes and opens this extremely luxe spa. Mm -hmm. And obviously that was you. Um, I'm just curious, you, you talk about being fine-tuned. Mm -hmm. The person before us now is fine-tuned. It's honed through experience and the confidence has been built from those experiences and those successes and 
the trials and tribulations. But I want to go back to the 30 year old Trisha mm -hmm. that was just starting that company yeah. on Myrtle Avenue or Murder Avenue or whatever Both. you want to call it. <laughs> like, what? Who was that person? Um, at that per time, I had a lot of confidence because I'd set a lot of records in my company. I'd worked at Matt Cosmetics at a very vital time of their expansion and who they were. Um, there was a point in the times where like everyone just knew that company, you know, and everyone just knew that brand. And I got to work there at that time. So it was kind of like, I don't know. I mean, I guess it's kind of like working at the most popular brand that you can imagine in the world right now, like working there. So then that's a huge thing that, oh, you work there? Oh my God, what's that like? You know, so I knew, I was very proud of where I worked, mm. but then I also really asked a lot of questions and really was competitive and really did well there. Um, and so I look up and I'm really helping to open stores for Mac all over um, New York and the East Coast. And I'm helping to train, you know, store managers and pull, build teams that are going to run these stores and really being trusted with their accounts and their largest accounts in New York. Um, and I'm 30 and it's like, I realize that that is a huge responsibility. Um, and I think I can do it on my own for myself and my stuff and my ideas. That's how I feel. Mm -hmm. I feel like I, if I can do it for them and they trust me, like I can do it for me. Mm -hmm. So I start just a notebook um, and I just start writing down my, my idea of this concept. And you know, that motivation and spirit was all around me. Like I'd go on Fulton Street and I'd see all these really cool black owned businesses and Lisa Price was on DeKalb with Carol's daughter. And I just had every reason to believe that I could do something like that just as cool, but myself. Mm. So I got to a point where um, I was prepared to do it, you know, and I'm, I'm strategic. So I had gotten myself financially prepared, like my, my living situation, my lifestyle, I was set up to really dive in and do the business. And so on April, first april fool's day i gave notice and i um gave a month's notice may one is my first day where i'm going to be just like sitting in a cafe and working on my business plan you know very casually and that's mm. literally may first and i'm sitting in a cafe and randomly asked the person that was serving me like if they know anything about the rents around here and the guy's like no but my landlord's in the back and he owns everything around here you should talk to him that like one conversation on day one of not having a job led to mm. me having a lease keys and a space within less than 60 days mm. and so now i'm forced to implement everything that i've been creatively writing in one notebook for the last three years mm. um and i just think at that time i just didn't care i was like yeah let's do it mm. and i didn't really know all the different places i would bump my knees and lock my head and i just didn't understand that at the time i hadn't opened a business in the city of new york before you have no idea how tough that is mm. you know so i thought i could do it and i think it's great that i thought i could do it i think now i'd be like oh god but mm. then, then i was like <laughs> yeah i just need to like get a you know get some keys and get a place and put some wallpaper up and it'll be fine you know what mm. i mean like i just was so naive it worked um and i've always had good ideas I've always had great ideas about marketing things. I've always loved, the, I didn't, before I even knew what marketing was, I've always loved in my mind showing off things that I love. If it's this glass of water, I'll sell you a gallon of it. Like that's just what it is. Yeah. Um, so I knew I wanted services at that time, nail services, beauty services, to be fun, to be chic, to be affordable, to be uplifted and just be upgraded overall in Brooklyn. And I thought that I could do that. And I thought that I could take that task at hand. And I did it and I did it well for 10 years. And so much so that I opened multiple businesses. Uh, but, you know, five years into the 10 years, it no longer stimulated me. I was already on to the next because I already told you I'm not excited about anything for too long. And I'm always thinking about that next chapter. So five years in is when I, I personally was checked out mm. and was like, what's next? What else can I be doing? And I'm just noticing that, you know, the only, only people really making money were the landlords and the, and the, and the real, real, realtors because they were like releasing the spaces or renting the spaces or selling this. So I was like, oh, those are the people that are making money. And, I'm, and I have people in my personal life that are really heavy in real estate. And I see the difference. We're coming out of the recession, but they're coming out faster. Mm. So I'm like, I love a note. <laughs> OK, because <laughs> I remember like just three years ago where you were. And now, voila, like you've dug yourself out of this recession hole. That really was a real estate crisis. But I noticed that real estate people were coming out of that hole faster. That brought my attention to real estate immediately. And I had a best friend that always thought that I should have been in real estate, like literally has never let it go. And I said, okay, I'll just get my license and I'll just try. And then I decided to get my license to sell houses because I was gonna make a lot of money and then decide to do another beauty business, something that wasn't so taxing, something that didn't require so much of my time. And I get in and I'm in for a year and I'm addicted. 
And so now it's like, I know I will be selling real estate. I always tell everybody, I'm going to be 80 years old, just click, click, clicking around. <laughs> just, I have a townhouse to go sell. I'll be right back. You know, like I, I know that I'll always do it at some level for the rest of my life. I've, I've made that decision about a year in because I do love it. I didn't expect to love it, but I love it. Mm. Um, but it came naturally out of the situation that I was already in. I wanted to make that better for myself. I was tied to my business, businesses. I was tied to them. And if I didn't have to be in one, I had to be in the other, or there was an issue that I was trying to resolve in one or the other from a distance. Mm. So regardless of how much you delegate in management, they're just things that come up in small brands that you have to be there for, you know? Mm. And I built a business around me and my personality. But the problem with that is that people expect to experience that when they come in. And I couldn't do it once I had two locations. It was impossible. Yeah. Um, so I think I got really committed at that time to doing something that didn't require me to physically be present all the time. And it just was like, okay, I need another business idea. Like it was very logical. Like I, people want to hear this passion project, but really it was just like, no, I want to make more money and actually work less, mm. you know? Um, just knowing that with that sentiment, I would still give it more and I'd still care more and I'd still be driven and I would still want to do it more creatively and more innovatively than most. I just, that's just, if it, it could be a Rice Krispie treat. I'm going to apply that much effort to it, you mm. know? Um, so I wasn't worried about that. I was just like, oh no, that sounds like a good idea. And then I get in and I struggled in the beginning a lot. But once I got my footing, um, as I do, I run and I run faster, you know? Um, and that's why I say that's the gift because there are people that are work that I, I believe are working and trying as hard as I am. But what I am so grateful for is when I really put my mind to things and really work hard. My results are amazing. You know, that's the gift. That's something I don't take credit for. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just fortune. And then being, yeah, just being fortunate, I think, you know, because I, I can't say that I'm working harder than everyone else. I do get great results though, because if I really zone in and focus on something, I'm, I'm gonna kill it. Mm. You know, there's mm. no doubt about that. Mm. That's a great confidence to have. Yeah. And it's, it's just as much reality as it is confidence. Mm. You know what I mean? Like I have my receipts, mm. plain and simple. And if you've worked with me, you know that to be true as well. Mm. So it is a level of confidence, but it's not just rooted in being confident. Because that's the thing that I think can be very confusing now is you must believe to achieve. Yes, you must believe to achieve, but study your shit. Know what you're talking about. Understand. Sit in that lesson. Watch that video. Take that training course. Focus on bettering yourself. You can't just dress up and show up places and think that you're going to do well because you're confident. That's a complete joke. And you're a joke to think that. Mm. You know, it's, it's really about just making the investment in yourself to do things at that level. And I think that that's what people don't understand. The late nights, the hard work, the tendency to not have days off. You know, like mm. my first year in real estate, I had, I had, uh, Thanksgiving weekend off. I remember that. I don't remember having another weekend off for a year, you know? Mm. And I was building this real estate business and I had a few people that I knew that were getting into real estate too. And they were like, can you do this? Can you do that? And I'm like, how can you do any of those things? I am so like low right now and so focused on this. I can't really even make space for too many other things. Mm. It was like, I needed to get this down and then I can run with it, right? Um, and the entire time I'm like, no, I'm going to kind of stay tunnel visioned around this. Like, I need to like figure this out. And I'm just so glad that I did because after two years that I could actually breathe, you know, cause it's like, okay, now the referrals are coming in, the business is coming in, the branding is there. People are starting to understand. I absolutely had the benefit of running this amazing brand in Brooklyn and meeting all of the dopest women in Brooklyn. That didn't hurt my business in any way that built my business. That was the base and the foundation of which I built my business on this following in this audience that I had captured over the course of 10 years. Mm. And those women believed in me then and they believe in me now. And so they drop my car, they drop my name, you know, they share and they're my, I call them my community ambassadors. There's a group of women in Brooklyn that you're just not gonna talk about real estate and think you're gonna get out of here without them bringing my name up. It just won't happen, mm. you know? And I think it's because they understand my passion for anything that I'm doing and they know Trisha overthinks, she over delivers, she over, you know, she, mm. she, she does too much. It's gonna be much. done right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like if it's team too much, I'm good with that. Like I've mm. always gotten that type title. That's fine. Yeah. It's gonna be too much. It's gonna be too much when it walks in the room. It's gonna be too much in the results. It's gonna be too, it's gonna be too much. Yeah. Write that down. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, 
um, again, because it's like, I embrace that. I'm not mm -hmm. going to try to change that because look what it's done for me. You know, I could walk in Atlanta and people knew that we're polished. You own Polish Bar? I read about you. Mm -hmm. You know, like who does that? I have a little business on Myrtle Avenue, like one on Vanderbilt Avenue and I'm walking around Miami and people know who I am. Mm -hmm. It's made an impression because it is an inspirational story and it's real and it's a black woman doing it and black women appreciate that, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the same in real estate. Like I know that I'm not just a real estate agent. I'm also, you know, that black girl that does real estate and you know, she does it like at that level and I'm just, too much, right? It's all too much, but it works. It works, it works, it works mm. every time. So it's like, I'll just be team too much. Just go ahead, I'll wear the shirt. <laughs> Is it a hat mm. to go with it? I'll put that on too, you mm. know, because it's like, yeah, like, have you not understood, have you not figured this out at this point that that is my special, that's just my special, you know, piece mm. is that I, I take it too far. Mm. You have to embrace, I, I've learned this and I'm, I'm increasingly learning it. You have to embrace what makes you different. That is the differentiator. Yeah. Uh, that is what's going to make you special. Your legacy, your brand is going to be built off of that. Absolutely. Um, I want to talk, I want to get deeper into the real estate stuff. Mm -hmm. But before we do, I want to, I want to go back to um, Polish Bar. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting words that you said, especially in the beginning, was naivety. And I actually have this, I think naivety is great in business because yeah. I think if you, and I'm, I'm feeling this right now as I'm building my company and I'm in those initial stages. If before you started doing it, you understood how difficult you would never it do was. It. it would never happen. <laughs> I would have like, never done anything. Without a shadow of a doubt, yeah. it wouldn't happen. There would be no businesses. Yeah. Um, so, and I think before you start doing it, and I felt this firsthand, all you see is opportunity right all you're seeing is like the upside of everything yeah, people and what need you to hear this build. they need to hear this yeah yeah and so i contrast that with there's a moment where and it's kind of in those early stages where you almost get punched in the mouth like you start to feel it's like you almost taste your own blood a bit like mm -hmm. you start to feel like oh this isn't just gonna like be mm -mm. easy no they're gonna kick you a couple times knock you mm. down drag you many times mm. yeah like even having polish bar there's a lot of criticism around that business there's a lot of criticism towards the business i guess maybe i took it personally but you know um what did they say you open a business people drag you because it's like why would you put that here in clinton hill you know people would open our doors and curse us out about our prices and close our doors <laughs> <laughs> Like they wouldn't even come in. <laughs> They're like, you must be, think, you must think you're crazy. You on Myrtle Avenue, Shut up. <laughs> you know, like no one captures the reality of how crazy it is to to build out an idea. You know what I mean? Like I had people, they would like break my door, like they just kick a hole in my glass door, like mm -hmm. you know, just crazy stuff. Um, really angry that we were putting this really nice business with a beautiful store facade and beautiful interiors and branding and like i had a little flag outside and like my storefront at polish bar was so uniquely different and upgraded at the time that i opened mm. that the city of new york gave me um, a grant to pay back the entire cost of what i spent on my store facade because it was such beautification to Myrtle Avenue. We'll, we'll cover that. Mm. You know what I mean? And it set a trend. And so now when you go on Myrtle Avenue or Vanderbilt Avenue, you're seeing what I saw 15 years ago. Mm. You know, like I would speak about Vanderbilt Avenue, like, no, it's so close to Barclays. It's going to really be like this depot of just restaurants and eateries. Like everyone's just going to go there. It's going to be ice cream. Like I would say all these things, there was nothing there but an old vintage shop, an old uh, barbecue place. And I think one cafe that sold like organic baked goods or something like that. There just wasn't a lot of stuff there. Nothing ever stayed open for very long, you know? And Myrtle Avenue was pretty calm and very quiet, but it just takes one. Like it just takes one thing. I mean, I was only there for a month before other businesses like would upgrade their facade or like change their door or just like, you know, it's like when you buy a house, like I tell people like you could buy a house and maybe the block isn't that pretty, but if you make your house beautiful, you will influence everyone on that block in one way or another. It may just be a potted plant that they place outside. Some people might do their whole facade. Like our neighbors, I know that we influence them to do things to their home. Like you just do your part. Everybody else will fall in line, you know? Mm. And that's what happened with that store. So it was very much 
um, at that time, it, it would look like I was spearheading a movement, right? Mm -hmm. And I wasn't, I was just doing my thing at my level and my expertise and um, what I'm proud of. And what came from that is other people following suit. And so when I go around Myrtle Avenue now and Vanderbilt Avenue, it's really great to see these communities have really morphed into what I always envisioned. It just made sense to me. I'm like, it's right by Barclays and it's like, you know, right by the park. Like this should be nothing but restaurant row, I would say mm -hmm. then. So now when I walk up there and it is, it's great. But I always saw that. I've always been able to see how things can improve. Like that's just my personality. I walk into a room I'm like, oh, I would redecorate it this way. Yeah. Or I'd add a belt there. I don't know. Maybe you should change <laughs> brown shoes. Like that's just... I don't know why I'm always critiquing everything, but I am. I just am not vocal about it. So yeah. if you ask me, I'm going to run with it. You know, I'm like, oh, yeah, by the way, I just made these little notes of 11 things I wanted you to add to that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, oh, it's just in your pocket. Yeah, it's folded in my pocket. I didn't want to mention <laughs> it, but since you asked. <laughs> uh, so I think that that's just what happens. And I think Polish Bar was that. And it was um, at first it was like, how do you have the nerve to put this here? Like mm. you have no right. And then it became the norm and it became the standard for everything that was on Myrtle Avenue. And if you didn't do it nice and fresh and cute, then you couldn't pull it here because we wouldn't let you live. You don't fit into what this is now. Mm. Everything here is gorgeous. Everything here is fresh and pretty and nice and new and well taken care of. Um, and there's a lot of pride in that community for things like and, and the sense of locally grown home owned businesses, you know. Um, and I definitely know that I'm a part of that conversation. You know, I, I know that, you know, because those things matter to me. and I was very vocal about those things. And getting local, you know, politicians and local leaders involved in that conversation. Mm. Um, it's just my, it's just my way. It's just my way. I've always been like, excuse me, I don't think that this is fair and this is why. Like, that's just mm. always my personality. Mm. And if we did this, we'd actually get better results because this is what I'm thinking. And, you know, 90% of the time people are like, okay, but 10% of the time they run with it, you know. And so that's how you impact change in an area that you live and you care about. And it's no different with sales, you know, like now that I'm selling in these neighborhoods, I incorporate these small businesses into everything that I do. If I'm shooting somewhere or if I'm something as small as a townhouse, I may be launching a townhouse, yeah. But I mean, I might look around to see, maybe is there a new boutique that's open around here? Or maybe a new hair salon that's open around here? Is there a way that I can incorporate them into the shot that I'm doing today? Or maybe the video that I'm doing today? I've done things as small as like, this is a new townhouse that I'm listing, but if you take this postcard into, you know, PEX, they'll give you a free coffee. Because mm -hmm. I wanna promote that cafe that just opened. And I want everybody that gets these 500 or 1500 flyers to know that this new small business is in their community and available to you. Mm -hmm. I'm really selling the neighborhood and the lifestyle. I'm not really selling the space as much as I'm selling what it has to offer, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think about those things because I, I, I do think about the impact of what you're doing. And if you, yeah, you can sell a house and sell that postcard out, but if you can promote a small business, why wouldn't you, you know? And mm -hmm. I don't wanna say that so everybody will follow everything I do, but mm -hmm. <laughs> they're gonna copy anyway, so let them copy because they heard it here, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I think there are ways to Figure out how you can benefit the things in your community while you're selling. And so it's important to me, like if I have a house in a certain neighborhood, it's important to me that I shop in that neighborhood. You know, I might go and buy a candle and flowers and even a tote in that neighborhood because I'm spending money in the neighborhood that I'm making money from first and foremost. And then I also want to promote what that neighborhood has to offer. Hmm. Um, like little things. Like yesterday I was shooting a townhouse in Fort Greene and I went to like the local florist and I was so excited. And then they were closed. And I was so bummed about that. You would have thought it was my floral shop that closed. Hmm. But I was like, ah, I was so excited to incorporate them into this amazing video that like 25,000 people would see. Hmm. Um, and maybe I don't need to think about that as an agent, but it's important to me. So I do. And I force it into the work that I'm doing. Hmm. You know, because it's like, yeah, it's about this townhouse, but it's also about Fort Greene and all that it has to offer. And those small businesses make up that special community. Mm. they're just as special as the house to me, mm. you know? Cause I guess maybe cause I've come from that environment, but I also know that those businesses add to these communities that we love and we clamor for. Mm. Like we, everybody wants to live in Tribeca or you want to live in this area, but what you want is the lifestyle that these, the yeah, that all of these homegrown businesses have created in these communities. Mm. That's what you want. And they're the ones that are risking it all to create that for the community. So I'd say, why not pump them up and bring them up, you know, put a little shine on them. I, I feel like I have to do it because of my background, but I also love doing it. I don't know that I would, I think I would still do it even if I wasn't a small business owner previously, mm. you know? It's like what makes neighborhoods so special. And everywhere I go, I know, I know what I love about the different pockets that I sell in, mm. you know? I'm like, oh, 
well, I want to make sure we share this. You know, it's, I, I think the studios and the groups that I work with, they must be like, oh, she's so over the top, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But they always love the outcome. And I always love the outcome, which is all that I care about. Mm. Yeah, you have a real appreciation of the details yeah. and understanding everything that goes into creating a great overall picture. Yeah. Um, and one, I heard someone say this about you. Um, she was basically saying that you could sell her anything. Mm -hmm. Nail clippings, pencil yeah. sharpener dust, <laughs> yeah. multi-level marketing yeah. scheme, <laughs> all of it. Yeah. And one of the things I think for anyone in business, not even business, just life in general, sales is such an important skill set. You can transform your life based off understanding key principles and fundamentals of sales. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious for the person that doesn't, just doesn't feel like selling is what they do. They just don't, they don't identify or even resonate as someone as like, yeah, I'm really good at sales. Mm -hmm. But you, you need sales in everything, right? Like it's such a powerful everything. skill to be everything. able to, to have someone see your vision. Mm -hmm. And so to the person that, that wants to get better at sales, wants to master that skill set, sees that it can impact their life. How do they get better? How do they focus? Because I think focus is important. Yeah. There's certain things that matter and there's certain things that don't really matter. Yeah. And a lot of the times I feel like in books and courses and all this stuff, everything kind of gets jumbled into one, right? They're giving us things that are just like nice to know. And then they're giving us the core principles. And sometimes the message can be lost. Right. And for me, I'm always like, what, what actually matters? What is the foundation? Yeah. If I really wanted to understand the foundation of sales so that I can apply that in my life and it has an impact, like, what would that be? What are the keys to sales, would you say? I feel like I've always been in sales, like in some way or another. I feel like I've always been in sales. And I think I'm good at it because I... I have stronger communication skills and I'm really descriptive. I think that that helps. And, and for me, I forget that I'm a salesperson. Like when people like, say, oh, she works in sales. I'm like, no, I do not. Like I don't really <laughs> ever, yeah, or I don't use the word sales too often. And I, mm. I just, if you ask me, I say I'm really good at showing off. That's what I say. Mm. And this is the reason why. What I'm really good at is if I like something, getting you to like it. That's what I'm really good at. Like if you were to bring in six of my girlfriends and open up their handbags, they're probably going to have the same like hand lotion that I have, lipstick, sunglasses. They're going to have 10. I think any girlfriend of mine has 10 things in their bag. They're like, oh, well, Trisha Lee told me that I had to get that fan or I had to get this. You know, I had to get the charger or like I'm always I'm always like sharing what I love with people. Mm. So. There's just no one that's close to me that doesn't like, I think all of us have the same phone case, like all of my friends and I, like, I think that that's, it's like that, you know yeah. what I mean? But what it is, is I like saying, oh, like, this is so cool. And look at what it does. Da, 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 you know, mm. isn't that great? You know what I mean? So that I get excited about. And so it's really the marketing and the sharing, like the communicating of what is special about this X thing. So I can be sitting down with you and drinking a sparkling beverage and just talking to you about why I like it. You're going to go buy it when we're done. Mm. Just how it is. Like all of my friends are like, you don't even work here. How do you make me get it? Like, you know what I mean? Like if you go into <laughs> Sephora with me, you're going to spend $400 mm. because I love beauty products. I know about every goddamn pro product out there, every hair product, body product, skincare product, makeup product. There's nothing that I don't know about. They mm. come in there like, Do, can we help you? No, I can help you. What do you have a question about? Mm. <laughs> you know, like, cause I know it. So I can sell it. And so if you go in the store with me, I'm like, oh, well, this is what I use. And da, 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 da. Basket full, ask any of my friends, you know? And I'm not selling, but yes, I am. But I think it's because I am communicating what I love and I am descriptive about it. Like I'm very descriptive about it. And I think that that's what is fun for me and comes very easy for me are those mm. two things. I forget that I'm a salesperson, you know, but I sell in a borough that I am obsessed with. You know, I love Brooklyn. I love Brooklyn. I don't know. I don't know who loves Brooklyn like I love Brooklyn. And then 
I'm obsessed with these neighborhoods, I'm obsessed with these structures, and I have vision. So it doesn't matter what you put in front of me, I can see it fully redone and completely re, re just completely remade. I've done that with stores, I've done that with houses, I've done that with apartments, I've done that with brands. So it's almost more exciting to be able to use vision on top of that. And I think that that's the key thing that maybe if you don't feel like you're a strong salesperson, do you think that you're somebody that has the ability to influence behavior? Because that's really what it is. Like uh, we're the real influencers. Salespeople are the real influencers. We are influential as hell, <laughs> you mm. know what I mean? Because it's like, oh, but did you look at it this way? And did you think about that? And you know, if you had this, you know, I'd be able to do this for you and do that for you and actually make this easier, shorten your time. But like, I could keep going, right? Mm. So it may be just the idea of what you're doing is like, tripping you up because I don't, if you hadn't said just now that I was a salesperson, it probably would have never come up that I was a salesperson. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? I am competitive and I'm competing with myself and I probably want to get more for that house than the next person. Mm. Definitely want to get more for that house than she, she or he gets for that house. Mm. And want this person to call me time and time again and drop my name every time anyone says the word real estate around them. So because I'm competitive in those ways, that's the pushing, forcing that's right behind me, like pushing me to do more and just try to push myself to create better results for these clients. Um, it's the competitive piece. And then the work itself, I naturally enjoy. I don't know how often sales comes to mind, which is so strange, but it's not because it's like I am trying to put that product out there in front of people in a way that they can appreciate it and see how it's unique, um, describe it in a way that's helpful, um work with people to negotiate about this product in a way and, and show value and 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 show you why you need it mm. and i don't know that that's any different from a house or a nail polish or a blush or a car i mean every time i go to the car dealership to get my car maintenance this guy that is there trying to hire me because mm. i could sell a car if i had to <laughs> like mm. while i'm waiting for my car to get repaired you know mm. i think it's just some of it you're naturally good at and the other stuff you can really work to get good at. You can, you can train, you know, you can invest in yourself. A lot of times as an entrepreneur, you have to remember that you need to be investing in that vehicle. If you're the vehicle, you need to be investing in it. You need rims, you need comfy seats, you know, you need a good, mm. cool air conditioning system, whatever. And so that's education and that's skills. Like I'm always learning and I'm always in front of a situation where I can be training. And if I'm not, then I align myself with other brokers so that I can learn from them. Like I am in my office and I sit back and look at who's here and what I can learn from them. And so I'm thinking about not just that like, oh, I'm Trisha Lee, I'm a great broker, but I can get better. And this is this is who I think can help me in this way. And I talk to individuals and say, you know, hey, I can I can share some things with you. Like people think I'm pretty strong on social media. I think I'm mediocre on social media, but have I worked with agents on their social in exchange for knowledge about things that they're really not smart about or experienced in? Yes. But I'm always trying to get better at things that make me good at my job or make me good at my career or make me just a better person. I'm always trying to improve in that way. Mm. You know, I like how you just, I like how you describe almost your sales process, which is first of all, the thing that you're selling, mm -hmm. you love. I love it. And I obsess that, over it. That's the, so that I like that as a basis, because I think, a lot of the times people are struggling in sales because they're selling something that they don't love. Mm -hmm. So if you start that as the basis, it's like, okay, this thing that I love, the only thing I need to be able to do is articulate and communicate why I love this thing. Then you add on the vision component, which is like, if this, if this product or this service was in your life, mm -hmm. this is where you could go. Yeah, look at how it would work for you and how, and how it would change things for you. I think that's so important. You know, I recently went to my first Beyonce concert mm. and I have people buying tickets in other states and going to see Beyonce because of what I've said about Beyonce. I'm like, look, this changed my life. I don't think you all understand. <laughs> you know what I mean? And they're like, no, we understand. We've been telling you. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, you just didn't articulate it properly. This is the way, like, and I'm explaining it. And everyone's like, yes, yes, yes. And so I put this post up one day and I was like, is it strange that after this concert, I kind of wanted to work out and write my memoir at the same time? <laughs> you know? And they're like, no, that's exactly, everyone's like, no, that's exactly how I feel. Like, you just put it so well, because I was so pumped up and so much in my she woman i can do anything get out of my way energy after this mm. concert i was like i need to be in sales for the beyonce concert <laughs> because <laughs> i think
think I've probably sold 12 tickets since I went to the concert. <laughs> Honestly, like people are like, I can catch them in DC. I can catch them in Virginia. And I'm like, you got to catch them because this is going to change your life. And this is mm. why. This is how it made me feel. This is what I did. You know? And it's like, it's a true experience. It's my true feelings. And I'm just articulating it in a way that people can appreciate, you know? And so I do have to figure out how to appreciate the product first. So there are homes that I maybe don't get. So I have to just do better work to try to figure it out and how to get it, you know, and how to understand the value of the home. Um, sometimes it ends up being the location and the proximity to different things. Sometimes it ends up being the space, the layout, what it can ha what you can do with this home. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it's just the home is just stunning and gorgeous and fine, whatever. But mm -hmm. so long as I get to a point where I have a great appreciation for something, I'm going to sell it. Even if you didn't ask me to, mm -hmm. I'm going to sell it. If I love your shirt, four people are going to buy that shirt in the next week. You should have seen this shirt. Okay, first of all, let me just tell you how it hung on his shoulders. You know, like, that's just me. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, and it's, it's not work, though. That part's not work. That's just my personality. Mm. Yeah. Mm. No. Because, I mean, there are too many similarities. Like, my girlfriend's like, oh, I got that. Because remember you told me about that? And I'm like, God, I go into your house. Your houses look like my house. <laughs> mm. You know? But I'm sharing things I'm excited about, you know? And I'm telling them why they're great. And they trust me because you have influence. So... It does, it doesn't feel like work, but it's an extension of work because it's who I am, you know? Mm. It's just who I am. I've always been like that. And I would say that you could interview someone from grade school, high school, college, and now, and it would still be the same. I really think so. Mm. Like, I think I've always had a very strong influence. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think the most powerful things in life is when it's almost like, um, it's like an expression of self. Mm-hmm. When it's almost just, it's something that's just innately about you. It's always existed. Yeah. And you're just letting it loose. Yeah. I actually think a lot of, that's what I'm realizing. A lot of life is actually just figuring out what you're good at and then letting it loose. Mm -hmm. That second component is difficult. Yeah. Because we, we get in our own way. Yeah. And sometimes I think we also try to deliver it in the way that we've seen it delivered in the past. And mm. we don't recognize, like, let's just see what your spirit will do if you let it free. You know, let's just see. And I've had to do that. Like with my, with my third, this is my third career now. I've had to figure out that maybe not pay any attention to what anyone else is doing and just do you. And that has been the secret to my point of difference. And I'm clear on that is I really, I, I'm never trying to keep up or duplicate or copy what I see anybody else doing. If anything, I'm trying not to be distracted by what anyone else is doing and just focused on what I'm doing. because. Yeah. Everyone has their own lane and everyone's very different. And I trust the way I do things. I trust, I trust my brand because it is just ever, it's just really a huge reflection of who I am as a person. I trust that a lot. You know, I don't have any questions about that. Um, so me trying to let all of that and set it free in a way that's just very non-traditional to our business, our industry, and how it's been done in the past is the part that I have to get over mentally because mm -hmm. The freeness of it feels really great, and it's when I get the best work. And I've and I've learned that in the last year and a half, I think a lot. Um, I think what Ryan Serhant does well is he doesn't set a lot of limitations on how things get done. He just wants them to get done, and don't set me free. <laughs> you mm. know, that's that's probably what you don't want to do. So it it's fun because it's like. I can express my brand in a way that's authentic to who I am and to what I care about. And I know that those that can appreciate that gravitate towards me. And it just mm. so happens to be a really large number of people, mm. a large number of women specifically too. Mm. You know, I've mm. noticed that. Mm. No, that's powerful. Okay. You know, um, even when you were talking about the beauty salons, there was something that I was like, I need to ask her about this. Because I think it's so important. Mm -hmm. You kind of outlined a journey where in the initial stages, there's like a difficulty. Mm -hmm. you, you start with optimism. You start with just seeing opportunity. You dive in headfirst and then it starts getting hard. Mm -hmm. And I think the problem for a lot of people is that when it starts getting hard, you start to, you start to lose that courage. Yeah. You start to lose that confidence. And the stamina. The stamina. And you know what? Ooh. I love that you use that word. Because the thing that came to my mind was like mental fortitude. Mm. People don't understand how important that is in business. And I'm starting to fully grasp it. It's so important. And um, it actually, it reminds me of a, a Nipsey Hussle quote. Um, and he obviously had this like tough road to, to get to where he ended up. Um, 
And he says, he was like, I never want to give this illusion that I had this ultimate poise. Mm. That I had everything figured out. Right. He said, my only distinguishing quality, the only one, was that I just didn't quit. Yeah. And I've heard so many entrepreneurs say that, which is like, people think I'm like a visionary and all this other stuff. And like, and I work really hard and all this. He was like, that was all great. But the best thing was that I just kept at it. Mm -hmm. And so I think you outlined something similar, which was like, in the beginning, it was tough. And it almost feels it feels like you're crawling and then walking, maybe not even walking at first. You're like dragging stumbling. yourself on yeah. broken fingers, <laughs> <laughs> dragging like a limp leg along. Yes. Yes. But you said that once you get up and you start running, you really start running. Yeah. Before we get to the running, I want to talk about in the stage where you're kind of limping along. Mm -hmm. What is, what is building that mental fortitude and maybe even use the example of those early moments with Polish Bar. Mm -hmm. Like what were some of those moments where stories, experiences, where it just started to feel really tough? Mm -hmm. Like those, those questions, sometimes it's questions of like, can I do this? Mm -hmm. Is it going to work? Mm -hmm. People don't talk about that enough. There's yeah. certain moments of self-doubt yeah. where you start to be like, you start questioning yourself a little bit. Yeah. Tell me, I think tell I had a those. lot of that in the beginning, uh, specifically with Polish Bar. I felt that, will anyone care, mm. right? Like, okay, that's great, but who cares? Mm. <laughs> oh, it's so cute. And you've, you know, you've put together this, because I just was like, I want this really great salon that people can come to in the middle of Brooklyn, and it's great, and it's, it's chic. And the, really what people do now didn't exist back then. Like, mm. Polish Bar set the stamp for that. Like, anyone will tell you that. You know mm. what I mean? Like, it was like... I was a small business in Clinton Hill and I had SE and CND and Minx Nails and OPI reaching out to me. Like I sat on the board of Dashing Diva. Like I was this little tiny person doing this little tiny thing, but huge brands were recognizing the work that I was doing, you know, like Equinox, America. Like I worked with every brand at some point and I started to realize, and it, I don't think it was even until like more recently that I realized like, oh, I was giving them that cachet. Because they were a big established brand, but I had a lock on Brooklyn and all that was cool in Brooklyn. Mm. You know, like I get it, but I get it more now than I did then. Because mm. I'm like, why does Chase want to work with me? Or why does American Express want to work with me? Like, this is crazy, you know? Mm. But I realize now better the lock that we had on that borough. Like, I literally was on a panel this week, and Lisa Price of Carol's Daughter said that when Carol's daughter first got bought by L'Oreal, they had to open a hand in foot spa as an expansion of the brand. This huge mm. step for this huge international company. Mm. And Carol's daughter, being of Brooklyn, decided to do their location in Harlem. But she shared it on the panel, well, you kind of had Brooklyn on lock. Mm. And I'm like, a brand like that would be looking at what I was doing? I was like one single girl trying to hold things together with a paperclip, mm. you know? Yeah. Um, but you can be that small and still mean that much is what, you know, is what that shows. Um, I did not plan for that, though. I was always planning for worst case scenario, if like nobody comes and nobody cares, this is what I can do. So um, just just quickly, mm -hmm. I think because I think we're, we're probably similar in that way, in that we just care about these things a lot. And so when you care about something a lot, you almost get like obsessive over the details. One of, I, it's funny, like I have the same, that was my same fear with starting this podcast. Mm -hmm. And the reason I think it's so frightening is if you care about something so much, right? what if no one else cared? I know. It's like so that's weird. almost like a, it's a, it's a frightening scenario. It's so heartbreaking, mm. you know, cause it's like, but this is all that matters to me. Yeah. Know? Like this is my life. Yeah. 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 And like I had, you know, left a company I was at for nine years. I'd only worked at that company since I was like, you know, maybe high school, no, college for sure. College, I was going to say high school. I had worked at this company forever and I didn't know how to work anywhere else. I didn't know how to do anything else. And so I'm opening my own business and I'm like, okay, well, like if only 10 people a day come, I'll be fine because this was the plan that I made. And that's not what happened. I opened my business on July 22nd. And we were booked out for two weeks at that point, the day that I opened. Mm. Like, you can come and see it, but you can't get up in here for two weeks. Mm. And then that led to the business just constantly being overbooked and over busy. You know, six months in, I'm stressed out because I have to open another location and I don't know where and I don't know how. 
Mm. Six months into opening a business, that was my next challenge, you know? Mm. So I was not prepared for the level of success that I had with that business. And I was young. And I also, who would have thought, you know? Mm. You don't think that you're opening something that's going to kind of change the landscape. And mm. it did, and it was wonderful, but it was really, really tough. It was really, really tough because I ended up having the problem of not being able to keep up with the demand mm. and not feeling like I had the support to, to really manage it well. Mm. Um, yeah, that was tough. That was really, really tough. But that that was just, I think that was like thinking like, okay, like, I was born in Brooklyn, but I'm not from Brooklyn. I grew up in Arizona. Those are my connections. I don't have relationships here. You know, my relationships I've established over time mm. and reputation. But like, I call this home. But at that time, this was not home. This is where I was living. Mm. And I'm building a business and I don't know a lot of people and I don't know how it's going to work. And then it works and it works really, really well. Mm. And I kind of had my ass handed to me because I wasn't prepared for the success. Mm. Um, so the tough parts for me with that business weren't the traditional tough things about opening a business. The tough parts for me were how do you manage the disappointment when people can't book services, you know, or how do you get people to be excited about the new location that's opening and not distracted by the fact that you can't get an appointment? Mm. Um, and people don't like when, when they can't get what they want. So of course the criticism came and it came heavy and it came hard if you know we weren't available or it was three days before we had an appointment. So it was like, we were so gifted and it was such a curse. you mm -hmm. know. Um, I learned a lot through that process of that business. I learned a lot about myself. I learned about, a, lot, a lot about my capability. I think I plan very differently now, <laughs> like mm -hmm. knowing that I have good ideas and they will stand out. A lot mm. of them, well, not every idea is good, but I have a lot of good goddamn ideas. I have a lot of things I haven't done yet that I think would be amazing still. And I think I do, I do um, infuse a lot of creative creativity into the work that I do now. Mm. And I try to do it my own way or put my spin on things. I think now I am better prepared for how things will work and how they'll move. Like I definitely feel like with my real estate career being my third career, I saw myself being where I'm at now, I saw that from day one. I was like, okay, I'm gonna like do something really special here. Um, and what I see for myself in real estate is not realized yet at all. Like I, I but I see it and, I, and it's mm -hmm. coming together beautifully. And I'm excited about that. Um, but now I'm prepared. And so I'm, I'm glad that those type of things had to be worked out at that point in my life, because now I have much bigger opportunities that don't, scare me as much and don't um overwhelm me as much i think like the things that now i have to consider and plan for probably would have been hard for me to process but i've had mm. so many experiences of winning and losing because like even with my business as great as it was ultimately i felt like it was a failure because i lost passion for it and i felt burdened by it eventually you know and i couldn't give it what it needed anymore because I didn't have it to give. I was gone. I was, you know, like I said, five years in, I was like, okay, what next? What else can mm. I do? You know, and then this is like up and running and I've got two businesses, 22 staff, and what are you gonna do? And I was just like, I gotta get out of here. That's what I gotta do. <laughs> like, mm. I don't know what y'all gonna do, but I gotta get out of here. <laughs> this ain't it. <laughs> yeah. You know, and just being honest with myself and being okay with that because I think especially at that point, everybody was like, well, what's wrong with you? Like, this is what everybody wants. It's not mm. what I want though. And that's what matters to me. What do I want? What makes me happy? And it doesn't have to make sense to anybody else. You know, um, five years into that business, I wanted to change my work and I wanted to change my life. So I just started efforting to do that slowly. And it took a long time. But when I finally like got to a point in real estate where like I have my business, I'm in real estate, I basically have like half of my body is in one lane, the half is in the other. I'm like going to the, to the real estate office seven o'clock in the morning, eight o'clock in the morning leaving there at one o'clock or two, then going to the, to the salons in the afternoon. I mean, the entire day for me for like a year was probably like 7 a.m. until like 10 o'clock at night. Mm. And that was my life six days a week for a year. And I worked, if my eyes could open, I was working, you know? But at the end of that year, I was in the process of closing that business. And I had, I think, 11, 11 or 12 contracts for sales um, in real estate. Mm. And 
I was like, oh, I'm set. Like, I'm like, I'm good. Like, I can now step into this fully and step away from that. And a lot of people would say, you know, you've done that. Why would you just step away from it? Because I'm over it. I'm off it. Like, it. if it's not something I feel good about and want to do, I can't give it what I give. Mm. And that's the worst version of me you can get, you know? Mm. So, no. I was more proud to close the business, maintain the brand, and now I have a freedom to do whatever I want to do with that brand in the future. No one has diluted it and no one has tainted it. Um, and I think I, I know that I'm still known for that brand as much as I am for real estate. So if I want to do something with it, I can, but I just didn't want to anymore, hmm. you know? And I accepted that and I moved on and, in, and probably not... Maybe not the way that most people think that I should have moved on, but I just wanted to be free of it. I didn't want to manage that many people anymore. I didn't want to manage that much day to day anymore. And I really would just say like, every time I work with a client, I just want to make more money. Mm. Like at that point, most of my clients like would come in and, you know, and and have a great time at my salon and they'd leave and they'd spend a hundred bucks and it was great, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'd be like, I wonder what it's like if they're spending a hundred thousand, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Or yeah. not six, $60, but $60,000. So I would think yeah. about that, you know? Cause it's like, I'm not, there's no shame in my game. I'm in business to make money too. Like, let's not yeah. act like it's all a passion. Women try to sell that story, no. Mm. I am trying to make some money so I can get out of here, mm. <laughs> you know? And I'm not, I'm not ashamed of that. It's fine. Like that's, that's what, that's what business is. Like at six o'clock, I start my life. That's a different story. Mm. But while I'm working, that is my goal. Earning more in less time, period. For me, for my clients, for everyone involved. Um, and I knew that real estate was going to allow me to do that. Like I had 11 contracts. I think it was 12 when I closed my business. It was either that was my 11th or my 12th. But I had enough stuff and contract to really like set myself up comfortably for quite some time with all those contracts. And I was like, well, shit, if I could do that, imagine if I had my full focus on this business, mm. you know? So it was very easy to close my business in a way that people were like, I mean, every day people ask me and I'm like, actually, you know, do you miss beauty? I'm like, I enjoy beauty so much. You have no idea how much beauty I enjoy now. Mm. Cause I'm not working in the space. I'm enjoying the space. Like mm. before I came here, I was downstairs at the spa. Mm. <laughs> you have a spa in the same building. And I'm like, oh, I need to come back here. I'm booking an appointment to come there tomorrow. Like yeah. I love beauty and I enjoy beauty even more now that I don't work in the space um, and that I work in real estate because I can enjoy beauty in a way now because I'm not there thinking about how it's flowing in operation. I'm just there chilling. I'm just enjoying it. And I still enjoy it so much. And then I realize how much things cross over into real estate from that world too, mm. you know? the client trust piece, the reputation piece. Like I am always in a situation I'm trying to explain to people. I think the question I get the most is how did you get people to trust you to sell their house after they just knew you from, you know, you went to their nail salon or that they went to your nail salon. Mm. You know, people visited your beauty salon. How did you get them to like trust you to sell their brownstone? That doesn't make sense. But when they interacted with me in my business or outside of my business, they got this, they got the mm. same person. They got a person that was very driven, very focused on business and success. And so I never had to convince clients from one lane how I would perform in the other. I've never had to do that. It's like, oh, that's what you do now, great. So I should fire my broker? Mm. Probably, okay, that's cool. Mm. Like I built that reputation and that trust already. So when I left my business, I had about 23,000 clients in my database and 90% of them lived in Brooklyn. 98% mm. of them were women, mm. <laughs> you know, 97% of them were the decision maker in the home. As far as where we live and what we pay, 97% of them, right? Mm. So I left that business with the foundation that I needed to build my next business. That's all I left with. And it was enough because it literally built a foundation immediately and then I just started to create different levels from there. Mm. But I had already done all of the work. Like you didn't interact with me in my salon and not realize that I was a businesswoman. You know, you didn't realize that I didn't have an appreciation for beauty, that I had an appreciation for these neighborhoods, that I have an appreciation for beautiful spaces, that I can talk profit margin, that I can talk, you know, anything, any level of marketing. You know, like you, you live in Bay Ridge and you're in my salon because I marketed the hell out of this business and you heard about it. Mm. You know, so there was never a time that there wasn't someone in my shop that hadn't come down from wherever upstate or from DC or whatever. Like it was like, my best friend always said, 
they don't just want to come here. They're clamoring for this business. Like that was something that I remember that point when she said that I was like, yeah, that's what it is. Like people would come to our door and it'd be a three hour wait and they'd be like, okay, I'll wait. Hmm. And I'm like, but there's three salons across the street. I wouldn't, why are you, why are you waiting? <laughs> you know, but you had an appreciation for what that brand meant and not even so much what it did. Hmm. And I found that women were very proud to be polished bar clients, you know, and then there was a reputation like, you know, people they were like, the hot girls go there. Like, yeah, all the bosses go there. Yeah. You know, like it was an extension of who you who you see yourself to be. Yeah. You know, like you didn't you didn't go there. You went you went to polish bar, you yeah. know. And so I would hope that I am able to recreate that in, in real estate to where it's like, well, I work with Trisha Lee, hmm. you know, and that that's all you have to say. Hmm. I guess that's really the goal, if I'm thinking about it. That's really the goal, you know? Like, that just that standard or what it is that that, it, what that, what my touch represents is, is probably what I want people to know. So you can trust it if it's a salon, you can trust it if it's a real estate transaction, you can trust it for whatever it is. Because I think not what I do, but how I do it is really the conversation. Mm, it's the brand. It's yeah. the brand. There's, um... I'm noticing a theme and I'm noticing a pattern, which is uh, you mentioned that when you were doing Polish Bar the first few weeks, immediately there was like lines, there was wait times. Uh, when you got into real estate, uh, the brokerage you were at, you were like the rookie of the year, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's just fast out of the blocks. Um, yeah. And I think usually when that happens, people tend to think it's like luck. Like, oh, like that person just got lucky or like maybe the timing was correct, but it's not that it's, um, I think there's an elite level of preparation mm -hmm. it takes to start something and have it be oversubscribed. Yeah. That means that you've been preparing, you've been laying the foundation. Yeah. And I think one of the most difficult things can be, and I want to go back to the moment when you were doing Polish Bar, but then you were also starting the real estate stuff. Mm -hmm is the feeling of like almost having one foot in each camp. So like the person that's, um, they're working a job, but like maybe they wanna start their own business, but they're not at the point where they can go all in on the business yet. So they're still having to work their job that they don't really sure about and also do the business. And I think one of the most valuable things we could learn from you is like navigating that process is the process almost like pre-launch right how can i prepare and how can i set things up so that when i do go all in mm -hmm. it gives the impression to everyone else who wasn't involved that oh yeah she just started and it just worked instantly mm -hmm. yeah obviously they don't see the behind the scenes yeah but i want to know what the behind the scenes was yeah yeah like what is it that you're doing so that when polish bar opens it's oversubscribed. Yeah. What is it that you're doing that when you start in real estate, deals are already there? Yeah. When you join Ryan Serhant's team, team Trisha Lee. Like yeah. the, the basis is always set up. What, what do you think you're doing? I'm very intentional about how I'm viewed. You know, like if you want to say that I care about how people see me, then that's fine. But I'm very intentional about how I'm viewed. So with my first business, it was important to me that people saw it as different and better and mm. an upgrade to what you were already doing. The standard was higher now. Mm. Um, I think that that's the credit that that business is given, that it did something that everyone else was doing at a higher level. Mm. And they made it, they added a cool factor to it, you mm. know? Um, How do you achieve that? I think you think about it. Like I had a muse in my head for who the Polish Bar girl was. Mm. And I was like, this is who she is. And this is the, this person. And and she had a name and she had a job and she had an income. And I, I imagined her to be a little bit of an exaggerated version of who I was. And then I thought a lot of women had a portion of her in them. Mm. So I only did the business for one person and it was my muse. And about two years into the business, I met the muse. Like it was, her name was Karen, <laughs> Karen Swoops. <laughs> and she was this person. And I was like, yeah. oh my gosh, you're my muse. Like you do what I think my, I created this person in my head and she, not only did she come to my business, she came to my business every week until she moved out of New York. Mm. Like I might still have her credit card number memorized in my head till this mm. day, honestly. 
Yeah. Um, so I'm thinking about what I'm doing. I'm not thinking about what anybody else is doing, you know? And I was doing a business that was catered to this type of woman. Mm. And I thought about everything that she would love and I built my business around this person. So at the time, the conveniences of the business, the communication style of the business, what we kept on file, like even our CRM, you know, we um, were advanced at that time. Like I'm running a business with a website, booking, booking options, like all the things you see now today currently in that mm. space didn't exist in that space. So you'd come in and it's like, hey, Lim, oh, great, your birthday's coming up. Well, guess what? We have 30% off of your pedicure because I noticed you only get your manicure done. You never get your pedicure. Mm -hmm. So we're marketing services to you that you're not already excited about. We're personalizing your service. You know, um, the system is sending you a birthday card a week before your birthday. You know, it's just little things that small businesses weren't doing traditionally at the time. Everything is branded in the space. So by the time you walk out of there, the logo is just like stamped in your head, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's all those things to the point where if people saw our color, our logo colors in other places, they're like, they're trying to do a polish bar over here. I'm like, ma'am, it is a bakery. They are not trying to do what we're doing. <laughs> like, are you, are, yeah. you're confusing what we do and what they do because you're seeing the branding and you're like, oh, they're copying you. And, you know, so it was such a great compliment, but very intentional. Same with real estate. Like, I definitely didn't want to go into real estate and be another real estate broker with my headshot. Like, that was never my thing. Mm. So I always push boundaries there. Like, why would I be memorable if I'm doing what everybody else is doing? I don't want the headshot now. You have a business card? No, I don't have a business card. If I'm doing my job, you should know where I'm at. Mm. You should know who I am. I still don't have a business card to this day. I don't know that everyone would be excited to hear that, but I don't, and I don't plan on getting one, mm. <laughs> you know? But I do own TrishaLee.com, and I've owned that for 20 years. So you can find me if you need to, you know? So it's, doing, it's things like that that I'm really intentional about and making sure that you can find me and that I'm viewed and that I stand out and above and beyond. So that has to be intentional and I think a little, little egotistical. That's not always easy because like sometimes even I'm over it, like, oh my God, here I go with this nonsense again. Mm. But I'm consistent with it, right? So it's like the Nipsey Hustle thing. It's like, okay, maybe you can say I was this and you can say I was that, but I know the only thing I was was consistent. Right. Mm. And that's the same thing with how I position my brand. I am always branding myself. I'm always sharing the elements of my true self, life and interests that are tied to that brand and maybe holding back and not sharing those that are not. You know, there are some parts of it that just don't fit into that brand that are still very much a part of who I am. But work is work mm. and I treat it and I respect it like work. So there are a lot of people that say, oh, I couldn't do what you do. You know, you just don't want to. You don't try. Like, mm. yeah, I do share my community i share great businesses that are opening i share great properties i share real estate in a way that's interesting to me and 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 maybe not the traditional way and that's fine um you know we're in a different time and space now that who you are and what your brand represents and even how you put out your product is important and it's in and you have to be innovative about it i'm not going to be on the back of that i'm gonna be on the front of it like yeah let's jump on let's get this out let's like work out the kinks early out like i'm not resistant to that change and that need for change i'm i'm like a oh, word let's do it like let's mm. let's figure this out and for now that's kind of ai you know maybe a year and a half ago the conversation would have been around video for our industry but whatever it is i'm not going to be resistant to it i'm going to try to figure out how to do it at an expert level because mm. only the expert level is going to make me feel good about it right mm. so i'm like let me get in there and try to work out these kinks now and try to figure this out so i'm always willing to do those types of things, but I'm always aware of my brand. And then so much of what I do share is just who I am. I love nice things. I love beautiful things. I'm not apologetic about it. I like nice stuff. Mm. <laughs> you know, I like nice spaces. I'll come into your house and wash your dishes and clean up your kitchen sink because I don't like the way this, like that's who I am. Yeah. You know, like I'm that person, like I'm in the store and I'm like straightening things. You see my stuff is here laid out psychotically <laughs> but that's what i need you know and it's yeah. so i didn't ask what you needed i know what i need and i want my stuff right here just so um so a lot of it is effortless because mm. it's who i just naturally am mm. i apply it to the work and then that's the great benefit that i get the work comes out better because all those weird quirks about me come out in the things that i do mm. um and again embracing who you are but it's so consistent that it works because i'm constantly doing it. Am I always sharing what I love about these communities? Yes. Am I always going to be? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you're tired of it. You know, I'm going to always be doing that. Am I always going to be trying to put a spin on the content that I put out around the work that I do? Yeah, because I want it to be noticeable. I want it to stand out and stand above everybody else. And that's no different in beauty or in brokerage. It's all the same to me. It's just like, not what you do, but how you do it. And they always, you know, they always say that it's like how you do it, 
one thing is how you do everything. Nothing can be further from the truth with me. Like mm -hmm. if it's a cake, like I am trying to decorate it beautifully. I am trying to get the best sprinkles. I want to go back to the store, get something else. No, mm -mm. I, you know, like I'm just like that. Like, you know, anyone will tell you that Trisha can be doing a barbecue. Mm -hmm. She's going to lay it out like it's a damn open house brokerage event, you know, but maybe that's why my brokerage events are really amazing. Maybe that's why my open houses are busy. Maybe that's why, you know, I might launch a condo in a, an apartment building and all the neighbors are there hanging out because the music is great, the drinks are good, the food is good, and they're taking a look at the work. But more importantly, what they don't know is they're watching me in my element doing what I do, how I do it. And so you're all here celebrating this house and you think it's great. Meanwhile, I'm meeting five, six, seven sellers. Mm -hmm. And my next seven listings are lined up now because of how I do what I do at the level I do it. So I don't apologize for it. And I know that it's my secret sauce, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's me, it's an extension of who I am, but I've always been that way. Like I was like that as a child. Yeah, you know what, um, Stephen Bartlett, he's, um, he has probably, in terms of like an interview based show, podcast, he's probably the biggest right now. His podcast mm. is exploding, um, getting a ton of huge guests and all of this stuff. And I was speaking with someone, he owns an agency, and he's worked with Stephen Bartlett's team um, on their marketing. People love their marketing. Mm -hmm. It's probably like some of the best podcast marketing there is. Maybe the best. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to him. I was like, what is it like working with Stephen Bartlett um, and his team? And he said, they're just very specific about every detail. Mm -hmm. They take every aspect of podcasting and they think, how do I take it to... What would the best version of this look like? And it sounds incredibly similar to what you're saying. And I think sometimes when we're thinking about how to achieve a certain effect, we think macro. Mm -hmm. We're like, oh, how do I get better at sales or like this broad category? Or how do I get people to want to buy? Well, what if you just took each aspect of the selling process and just made it the best it yeah. could be? And you just took that mindset and you focused on each detail. Yeah. And once that accumulates together, mm -hmm. you will be the best podcast the best I yeah. don't know, agent the best salesperson whatever it is um but just that mindset of perfecting each detail yeah um, i think it's important in what we do you know i think it's so important like i care about how i present content mm. properties and myself you know like that's a part of it too like i walk into rooms all the time in real estate be like oh you're always dressed so nice you're why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I? Hmm. I am my brand when I walk into a room. You don't think I'm going to take the extra time to do like, why won't you? That's the question. Because <laughs> hmm. I'm very clear on who I am and how I have to represent my brand. That is why, you know, I have to take those. You know, like I hear that little, there's a meme somewhere out there that's like, you know, like this, this MF -er never misses. And I'm hmm. like, I want people to say that about me. She don't ever miss. Nope, she don't ever miss. I don't, I don't have the luxury of missing. So, I'm going to take the time to look at that one more time, read that one more time, check that one more time, put myself together, walk into the room looking, feeling, being what I need to do because I don't have the luxury to half-ass things. I do mm. not. Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> you know? What makes you say that? Um, you don't have the luxury. I still believe that for what I am trying to do specifically is build a sizable business in New York City real estate as a black woman. I still feel that there is a different route for me to do it, you know? And every one of us, anyone working at this level is working hard. That's not, that's not a conversation about working hard. But I need to get into certain rooms. I need to have certain access. I need to, you know, you can't sell $8 million apartments unless you know people that have $8 million apartments. There's no other way to do it, right? Mm -hmm. So I have to care and be more detailed about things because I have to think about everything I put out and how it looks in front of anyone that could possibly see it because everyone is my future potential client. Mm. You know, even if you work at the spa that I go to, mm. you are a future potential client or your mom is or your boyfriend is or the owner of the spa is. Mm. So um, it's gotta be good, it's gotta be authentic and it's gotta be consistent because you just never know. I mean, like our business is based off of meeting people. So I meet people every time I leave my house. Mm. I meet people every time I do something like this. Um, so I don't have the luxury of not caring about those details. Mm. Not that I would take it if I had it. 
I don't know that that's even my personality, but I don't have that luxury. I don't give myself that that as an option. No, kill it every time. Hmm. I found it interesting earlier on when you said, um, like, I'm team too much. Yeah. Like, I'm happy to be team too much. Yeah, because people used to always say that about me. And I was just like, oh, well. And then I was like, okay, well, yeah, too much it is. Mm. <laughs> I guess the, I, I want to just, before we finish up, I want to I wanna get the other side to it. Because one of the things that you mentioned with Polish Bar, mm-hmm. it felt like a failure almost to you because you just didn't want to do it anymore. And the thing that it reminds me of, and it's something that I'm constantly telling myself now with my business, because I like to go intense. I like to go into it and I like to figure it out until it's resolved. Yeah. And the thing I've been telling myself recently is slow down a little bit and just make sure that you, you can't burn out. You can't mm. get to that feeling of, because I don't worry about frustration like so much, that feeling. I worry about indifference. Oh, when, yeah. When you reach a level of burnout that you don't care about any outcome, you're just tired. You just, you don't care. And I think that's when, that's, that's the worst thing for entrepreneurs because that's when you quit. That's when you stop doing the thing is when you have the indifference. And so for you team too much um obsessing over the details uh this constant drive and you even mentioned it in the beginning Mm -hmm. is always being driven what's the next thing what's the next thing what's the next thing i'm curious is that is the exhaustion aspect is that something that you struggle with is that something that you worry about that you're concerned about no, because I'm very real. So I'm very vocal about when I'm exhausted. I'm very vocal about feeling overwhelmed. I'm very, like, I am very conscious of not coming across as somebody that is doing it all right. You know, I do, every time I use my voice, I use my voice to, to say, these are my challenges. This is what I love about it. Like these, this is my interesting perspective. So I'm honest about burnout and I'm protective of my own spirit. I'm very, very protective of that. Like I have one day a week where no one can reach me and nothing can be done. And I don't care what it is. It will burn to the ground because you're not going to reach me hmm. because I need that. Like I know what I need to come out and be fighting and fighting and fighting, you know, energy and fighting like condition. And because I know what that requires, I have to be super protective of the restoration. Mm. So um, I don't worry about burnout because I protect my energy and I protect my time. Like I have my down times and I have my down days. There are times of the day you will not reach me no matter who you are. You're just not gonna reach me, Mm. you know? And the same can be true for a day of the week that I take or how I fold my own self-care and my own self-love into my days. How I start my days is a huge part of it. Like what I will say yes to and no to is a big part of it. I don't worry so much about burnout anymore because I've gone through that and I know what that is and I know the signs of it. So now I have boundaries set up that are like, "Mm -mm." and I don't make it a business, my business to explain the no, I just say no, you know? Mm. I don't worry about burnout. I do, I guess I worry more about sending this false message of there is something that I have that you don't have that makes me able to do it and you don't have you don't have it I don't think that that's true I think that you got to figure out for yourself what motivates you and what you care about and how you can like fuse that into the work that you do because the money ain't enough the money is not enough. Like with Polish Bar, well, money was never enough. But mm. the accolades and the visibility would have done it for a lot of people. They'd have been like, I'm good. Everybody knows who I am. I'm good. Mm. That's not enough, you know? And then now I get into real estate where I can make what I made in a year in a day. Mm. So now I know the money is not enough either, right? So I'm mm. cl- it's like, check, check. I'm clear on those things. So what I do know now is that I still want to be enjoying it. I still want to care about it and I want to love it. But I, Trisha Lee, cannot be trusted to not burn out unless I put certain systems in place to protect myself from that happening. And so to me, that is just having 
a end time or a, a sharp end to my day. Like I just have a day where I'm no longer available. I'm no longer thinking about work. And I'm honest about it. And I have my clients understand that, you know? Mm -hmm. And that has helped a lot because I don't think I suffer with burnout as much because I'm always like planning for some level of restoration, whether it's in my day or in my week. Um, and I'm also thankfully at a point now where I can say no to the things that aren't as meaningful to me, mm. you know? So I try, I try to do less, you know, than I would have probably done maybe three years ago. I don't feel, I don't work from such a space of a desperation anymore. I think that that's good. So there are things I say no to and a lot more. Um, that is fortune though. That's getting to a point where you can do that, right? Or you feel that you can do that. Mm. So I'm glad that I'm there. And I'm glad that I'm there very early. Like I'm only seven years in the business and I'm there and that's great. Um, but I think that it's hard until you go through it and you realize how destructive it is. I don't know that people are warned in how important it is to, you know, make sure you're good in this entrepreneurial um, journey because it wears you down and it makes you hate it sometimes. Mm. It does, you know? And like for me, my first business, I was like, that is a dream come become a nightmare. Like that's just what it was for me. I was like, my own dreams are turning into a nightmare. I don't want to do this anymore. And I think that the, the, the freest that I can be is to be honest about what that is. Like, I don't want to do it anymore. And that's enough, to, that's enough reason not to do it anymore versus feeling like, well, I've built that, I've done that, now I should. I don't have to do nothing I don't want to do. Mm -hmm. I can do exactly what I want to do. And that's what I try to do. Because when I'm in that space, everybody wins. I create the best work, I'm the happiest, and the results are amazing. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to honor that and understand that, that what I do and maybe how I show up is going to completely continue to change you know, and understanding like, what is it that I'm actually building? I don't know that it's only a real estate business. I feel like it's more of a brand and a lifestyle business because it's not just what I do, but it's how I do it and it's my approach to it. And I think that, I hope that that's what people get from, from me more so than like, oh, she sells houses. I think anybody can sell a house, mm. I think, mm. you know? But I would hope that what I leave you with is the ability to figure out how to make yourself okay in this entrepreneurial journey. Cause it's really exciting and amazing and it can be, but you got to figure out how to make yourself okay. I have figured that out. And even when I'm doing things, I just don't want to do And I'm like, oh my God, I'm already planning how to treat myself good after. Cause there's just certain things where I'm like, mm, I don't really want to do that, but mm, that'd be like, that's important. Let's get mm. it done. And so I do, I, I get through it with the like, okay, but you're going to give, you're going to take it a little bit easier tomorrow, or you're going to be, you're gonna be mindful of this. And I'm just always trying to love on myself and make sure I'm good, you know? Mm. Like, if I'm under the impression that I would hate myself as a boss, there's something wrong. So that's what I try to think about. Like, in your worst job, do they treat you worse than you treat yourself as an entrepreneur? <laughs> mm. You can't be a bad boss to yourself. You gotta figure out how to be better to yourself. I have figured out how to be better to myself. Has it impacted my productivity? By 20%, absolutely. Mm. But I'm happier. And I think that's what I value in this space in my life. That's what I value, is having a better journey through this. You know? Um, maybe that's what matters more to me now. You know? And I feel that that is a stronger impression that I leave with people is like figure out how to do things your own way and how to do things in a way that you love it. And um, recognize that it's you that in all of this, like I feel like, I don't really feel like it matters what I do. I feel like it's just how I do things that I really put in front of people. Mm. And I think I can take that and build that into any business I want. Mm. Like I think I could do ice cream next week if I wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> and it'd be cool and chic and everybody would want it. You know, and maybe that's queuing off around the block. Yeah, or... like, oh look at that eating my ice cream. Oh, you got a shirt on, he has a hat, you know, like <laughs> but you know, maybe that's me being, you know, maybe that's me just seeing the world, you know, through my eyes. But I believe it. I really do. You know, it's just kinda like, what do you want to do next, Trisha? So there's times I just am just sitting around thinking about that or, you know writing about that and I have a lot of ideas and a lot of things written down and a lot of concepts and um, it's really just like playing those things out, you know, but I feel like I leave people and women with more of a feeling of um, I'm capable mm. and I can do it 
and she did it, I would hope, um, then look what I did. And it's just so easy. You can do it too. Nothing's easy. We're all working really hard. I am working really hard. Anything I've ever done that was great was really hard. It's mm -hmm. a lie if I say anything else, but I enjoy it more. Mm. And that's important, you know? And also giving myself the freedom to know that the things that light me on fire will change. And I can go in that direction too, as, as I start to discover those things, you know, mm. I'm not like just a realtor. I, I can, I can do this and I can do five other things that I love and share that with my audience too, mm. you know? Um, but I think it's also the time we're in. I don't, I just don't think that things are as limiting now. I think that no matter who you are and how you do it, there's space for you. Mm. And that's so exciting to someone like me because I learned how to work in one culture and I get to thrive in another culture. So I'm, I feel like I get the best of both worlds. Mm. You know, like I learned how to carry myself in a corporate space. I learned how to stand out amongst my peers. I learned all that stuff that was what was right at that time. And now none of those rules are the rules, but I have that foundation. And so now I'm in a space where things are far more gray than they are black and white and there's space for everyone. And if you don't like a lane, just go over there and make your own lane. Mm. And that is so exciting to me. That mm. is just, you know, that's just so exciting. I mean, it's in how I do my nails, it comes out. You know, mm. I'm like, mm, I don't have to make a decision. I can do whatever I want. Mm. So I do, and I purposely don't match my hands because I feel like that is just a very silent expression of you can do whatever you want. Mm. <laughs> there's no rules, mm. you know, like to basic things like going and getting manicure. What color am I gonna get? Get them all. Mm. Is that what you want? Do you want nine colors? Do that, mm. you know? So I hope that in anything that I do, I hope that that's what I'm selling. Is that feeling, I guess? Yeah. You know? Just limitless possibilities. I, I love that. I love that as a point to, to end on. Yeah. Um, no matter who you are or where you're from, there is a space for you. Absolutely. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Trisha. It's a pleasure having you on the show. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> that's a lot of fun. <laughs> If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the channel. We're having fire conversations every week on the podcast. Before we end the episode, a quick word from our sponsor, Free Agency. What if I told you there is a good chance you're leaving money on the table in your career? It would kind of annoy you a bit, right? Well, Free Agency aims to stop that. They represent and manage talent in the tech industry. Here's how they do it. First, they provide you with a dedicated talent agent. Think about this as your career quarterback. They understand you and your career goals. Based on that understanding, they bring you suitable interviews at top firms. You focus on smashing the interview and together with their network, research, negotiation expertise, they will make sure you get a top of market salary. Stop job searching alone and start building your dream career today with free agency.